Dear colleagues, friends and enemies, thank you Vitra Life for inviting me to uh, this uh, second most beautiful city in Sweden. Uh, the most beautiful one is Gothenburg. If you have some time over, you should really go there because it's a lot nicer than here. Um, it's great to be able to um, come and, and talk to you about um, a subject I didn't choose myself. Silver chose it, and I think he did it really well. Um, you might remember that I had the honour of speaking at the symposium last year uh, where we started talking about controlling uh, variables. Um, but this year, Silver actually added um, the lessons learned in a clinical setting. And it was actually great because it inspired my whole talk when I put it together. Uh, a variable is a symbol that stands for a value that might, may vary. The term is us usually occurs in opposition to constant, a symbol for a non-varying value. Now, uh, our patients like we talked about before, is obviously our biggest variable. And we can only try to keep constant as much as we can and allow patients, maybe in the future, to be our only variable. Uh, so the word clinical setting is sort of what I want to concentrate on. A clinical setting is the real world. It is a real IVF clinic, a uh, the real clinical setting, the real deal that faces me every morning when I come into work and it faces you every morning when you come into work. I think it is important to underline that it's extremely different from the experimental setting, the standardised setting that has inclusion and exclusion criteria. They are the ones that we are faced with at the presentations of this conference. They are experimental settings. A lot of the talks you will hear at this conference will have inclusion and exclusion criteria. And a lot of the products that are sold are trying to lure you in to think that you can buy a solution. And what I try, want to try to give with you to take home today is that there is not one solution that you can buy at this conference for your clinical setting because your problem is much more complex than that. So, we can buy the solution. These are uh, two of the best clinics that I have visited. You can buy all the equipment. You still have the patient coming in as a variable. Like I said before, she might be fat, slim, old, young. Uh, we have a fat husband, a useless husband, all sorts. Um, we can't control that. Uh, we can have the other part of the spectrum. Uh, these are actually the nurses watching, washing the socks and the gloves, they hang at the same line there. So we face a lot of variables, but there are a lot of... If you go through the exhibition at the ESHRA here, there are actually a lot of, pay, a lot of um, companies that think that we can, we can sell a solution, one solution for these clinics, by this incubator, and that's all you need to do. But actually, there's a lot more that needs to be done here. So if you remember last year... Uh, well, let's agree that the clinical setting has variables, but what we need to know is how can we control them? And we actually need to know what they are to know how we can control them. So last year, I had the pleasure of talking about pH, osmolarity and temperature. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to talk a little bit about culture systems, uh, influence of the clinical decisions, uh, the variable that Steve said before, uh, our doctors, God bless them. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit of the rebirth of slow freezing and to see if freezing can help us overcome some of the clinical variables that we're, cha we're faced with. So to start off with the culture system, um, just to give you a short refresher of where I am, what is my clinical setting, what is, what is the place that I drive to work to every morning. Uh, Westmead Fertility Centre is located in the western part of Sydney. Uh, we're affiliated to Sydney University. We sit in... Um, New South Wales, biggest hospital, maybe Australia's biggest hospital, I don't know. We do a, a tad over 1,300 cycles annually. We do around 500 frozen embryo transfers. We do a lot of IUIs. Uh, we are a public, private, not-for-profit organisation, uh, which means that uh, the little surplus that we make every year goes to me to invest back into the lab 
uh, which is a very exciting thing. Um, Patients in Australia doesn't pay much for IVF, uh, which is a reality that I think is important to understand here. Um, the government of Australia, through a Medicare system, sponsors uh, the IVF cycle. So the maximum patient that comes to Westmead Fertility Centre is paying is $1,200. Then it goes down. The more cycles they have in one year, the cheaper it gets. And also depending on what other things they do medical, if they, if they have a, another procedure done, it can get as cheap as $50 per cycle. This includes everything. Uh, so another thing is that 80% of our patients have single embryo transfer. We obviously transfer a maximum of two embryos. Some of you might remember this. This was my reality last year, uh, a system where we had a lot of ups and downs. We varied Every week was a new week. Sometimes we managed to keep the, uh, our head above water where we got above the, the, the 40% that I, I would say would be acceptable. Um, but we crash landed at other times. You might remember that after the crash landing we had at the beginning of the year in 2010, we decided to leave that media system that we had then. And after a bit of a learning curve, we, we entered some some stable waters. Now, just to go back here, look at the 30% line here, how often we dived under the 30% last year. Looking at the same period this year, we have had one, two, three occasions where we've been below that on, on average. Um, so we're doing much better. We're keeping our face above water, but we still have the variables. This is weekly, and, and we do around 30 pickups every week. Um, so how come that we peak sometimes? How come we crash sometimes? This is what we need to learn. We need to learn our clinical setting. If we compare 2010 all over, this is a smoother line because it has 100 patients in each curve. We can see that we have improved. Um, we improved a lot over Easter. Um, we have done a little bit of a dip recently, but that is because we've introduced an extremely stringent single embryo transfer uh, protocol where literally everyone has single embryo transfers now. So does this work um, in our clinical setting? Well, I think it does. Uh, one of the first things I would like to talk to you when it comes to the culture bit of this clinical setting is the pre-equilibration of dishes. Uh, we touched upon it yesterday, uh, last year and Fortunately, David has actually prepared the way for this, and it is about ammonium buildup in our dishes. So the example I want to take for you is, let's say we do a thaw of a 2PN that we're going to uh, culture to a blastocyst. That um, needs to go in our cleavage stage medium first before we change to our blastocyst medium, and it's going to be able to spend some time in that medium. Or this might be a and a, a 2PN that goes into a fresh dish after a fur check from a normal IVF. Now, we did some uh, experiments, and this is actually done by a student in the audience. Where are you? Where is she? There she is. Stand up. No. <laughs> So Dana did this, uh, this work in Sydney with us. Uh, we cultured uh, mouse embryos in dishes that had been pre-equilibrated at different times. Because if you heard what David was saying about the ammonium buildup, it is not so much the embryo. It actually is the time that that dish is spending in the incubator. And looking at here, this is the time a, the cleavage stage medium spent in the incubator before we change the medium. Uh, we can see that if the total time in the incubator is 49 or 51, we have an acceptable rate of uh, embryos that reaches the 6 to 8 cell stage compared to the embryos that are less than 6 cells. But if we go above that time, we will get a decrease in the cleavage rate. Uh, it also has a knock-on effect on blastulation rate, uh, upregulation of certain um, uh, imprinted genes... We get a change in osmolarity, and all of these problems is probably due to a build-up in ammonium. I'm not going to preach like I did last year of when you're going to prepare your dishes, but I've come to the conclusion that it's important that we put down a best before on the lid. 
So if you're going to make up your dishes at 12 o'clock the day before you're going to use them, you have to count that time into the total time the time the, the dish has been in the incubator. So if you put it into the incubator today, remember what David said about the time it can spend in the incubator and put a time when the embryo has to leave this dish and put that down on the lid. Speak to your manufacturer. How long time do you recommend for this medium to be in an incubator? And is that if that is 50 hours or 40 hours, then put that best before time on the, uh, on the lid, uh, lid of the dish. Another thing when it comes to culturing embryos that we have experienced uh, both at Nurture and at, at Westmead is that it's good to leave things alone. Uh, we've done some extensive experiments where we take embryos in and out of incubators uh, on a daily basis and this is all done in the mouse em- uh, model. We cultured uh, zygotes, mouse zygotes, to the blastocyst stage They are taken out for three, five or eight minutes daily, placed in an ambient uh, environment, still in a warm environment, so it's not a temperature effect. It is an effect of an ambient situation when it comes to to gas and uh, to changes in pH and the rest of it. We looked at embryo development, genetic consequences and the health of the offspring. And if you're interested in hearing a lot about this, you can hear um, George talk about it tomorrow unfortunately very late in the afternoon, but it's a very interesting paper where we've shown that the more you take embryos out of the incubator, even if it's for a very short time every day, you do affect the blastocyst development rate, the viability of your embryos, cell death in your embryos, and the imprinted gene expression patterns. Fetal weight is affected by taking dishes out of the incubator. So it might be a good idea to check embryos all the time and score them and know all all about them, but remember that you are killing them in the process. So does this lead to any type of success? Well, we do a fair bit of blastocyst culture. I would say that we're somewhere between 60 and 70% of our patients have blastocyst transfers. Um, Looking at the cycles in 2000, uh, from 2010 when we introduced the G5 series, uh, we had 616 uh, blastocyst cycles. The average patient age was 34%. And I would say that our clinical uh, positive fetal heart rate of 44% when 1.1 embryo is transferred is, is pretty reasonable. I, I would say I'm not ashamed of it at all when you come to the fact that Uh, the average number of cycles these patients have had is over four. Um, Looking at the grading of embryos, which is is another very interesting thing. Now, we never refuse a patient transfer. We never say that you didn't have anything to transfer unless everything is stone dead. Obviously, we all know that the grade A blastocyst, the beautiful form blastocyst, will have our highest clinical pregnancy rate. But the grade B blastocyst, the slightly lower grade of blastocyst, doesn't come that far after. But when we put back a grade C blastocyst, uh, we do have a little bit higher number of embryos transferred in this group. There is still a reasonable 30% uh, clinical pregnancy rate in that. And I think that these numbers from Westmead was exactly what we had at, um, at Nurture in Nottingham, where we saw that a little bit over 30% of the great C blastocyst actually gave a pregnancy to that patient. So we don't cancel any transfers. We give the patient the best they have, and it does work in 30% of the cases. But what are the, what is the, are the um, effects of our clinical decisions? Because obviously we only receive the oocytes from the patients directed from our clinicians. So looking at the ups and downs of, of my life, this was last year and this is this year, what, what is the significance of, of what happens here? Why is Easter time this year so much better than Easter times before? And what is it that has happened here? Well, what I realised when I got to Australia, I, I came from Nottingham, which where our clinicians are extremely cautious with how they stimulate. We bring p- patients in on a daily basis for scans. I would say that 80 to 90% of the patients are on a long down regulation protocol and very few are on short protocols. I arrived in Australia and realised that doctors are very much influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. And what happened at the beginning of uh, last year was that 
the drugs we use for short protocols became free on the market, so the patients didn't have to pay for them. So the pharmaceutical companies invited us for 30 dinners every uh, week at flashy restaurants, and hence, what happened to me? I saw a dip in pregnancy rates. Um, and there is a beautiful publication, and I think that we all should go home and look at it, because the reality of my dips was nothing new. There is a Cochrane report that was published uh, the first time in 2008, 2009, and it was refreshed again in 2010 with no changes to the conclusions, where it's clearly shown that ongoing clinical pregnancy rate is significantly lower when we use a short protocol compared to long down regulation protocol, and so is the live birth rate. So it, the, the actual conclusion of this paper says that it, when a clinician decides for different reasons to use a short protocol, they should inform the patient that they are now in for a lower chance of pregnancy. But none of our doctors did that. Uh, so when I started dividing our data from last year into long down reg cycles and antagonist cycles, I found that we had a 41% clinical pregnancy rate with our long down regs versus a 28 for the short cycles. And I said to the doctors that if you're going to continue using short cycles, then you better present this data in front of the patients. They need to know what chances they are looking at when it comes to the protocol we're using. Now, I'm not saying that this is the situation in your clinic, but it seems like the the way we run our clinical day-to-day, -day, my clinical setting, we are not good at handling short cycles for whatever reasons. Another thing is the endometrium. David was mentioning at the start here that the whole idea of a stimulated cycle actually mocks up the whole endometrial receptivity. And I think we have all a long time dreamed about doing freezing everything. And if you're going to go home and read any paper, you're going to read this paper uh, when you get home uh, that was published in RBM Online this year by Van den Varenberg in uh, the group in Brussels, where they've taken endometrial biopsies on the day of HCG. So this is in the same cycle where the patient is going to have an embryo transfer. They've taken a biopsy and they've done microarrays on those biopsies. And what they found is that they saw a complete shift in gene expression patterns in patients below 1.5 nanograms per mil of progesterone versus the ones that had the higher level progesterones. The higher level progesterone patients had an endometrial pattern already on the day of HCG that was starting to prepare for, for a menstruation for a shredding of that endometrium. So it was long gone. It was no use for us to create a grade A blastocyst because it was going to go straight in the bin, which was that, that patient's uh, uterus. So we, as a result of this paper, looked back at uh, our cycles and uh, we had results from 1,863 uh, patients where we had, uh, sorry, 2,069 patients where we had looked at progesterone levels on the day of HCG, and we actually found that it halved the chance of pregnancy when we put embryos back in a patient that has an elevated progesterone on the day of HCG. So what do you do? You freeze. But then you have to trust your freezing program, and I'm not sure that I did that um, a while back, but... Um, we are in a situation now where we can start trusting freezing because it actually works quite well. So now I want to touch a little bit about the rebirth of slow freezing. I walked past the sign today in the, in the exhibition that says, bye-bye slow freezing, hello vitrification. Sounds really good, I'm not convinced. Uh, this, is my, uh, this is our frozen embryo transfer um, results. Uh, the red line here uh, represents ladies that are uh, uh, less than 38. This is our overall pregnancy rates. And this is the older ladies that has now come to a point where we have the same pregnancy rates in any age from our frozen embryo transfers. And now you might wonder what happened here. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. Um, vitrification versus slow freezing. Everyone thinks vitrification is great. It's so quick, isn't it? Well, my clinical reality is that 
about five, five patients a day has around five embryos each to freeze. If we're going to vitrify them, I'm going to have to tie up about three embryologists for the whole day to do that. I don't have that. So if I'm going to vitrify that, four embryos takes us about 15 to 20 minutes to do for every four embryos. I pay $50 per embryo for the device. If I do slow freezing, it takes five minutes one embryologist per patient. I can have that for five minutes. We all sit, we have five flow hoods in the lab. We have five workstations. I have one at each. And within a few minutes, we're finished with that day's freezing. Slow freezing is slow if you have a system where you sit and stare at the freezer. Talk, talk, talk. No, I don't know anyone who does that, but it is also cheap. It costs $1 per straw. So we read a paper by David Edgar et al., which was published in IBM Online in 2009, where they'd done some modifications to the uh, slow uh, embryo freezing system, and we managed to convince Silver down here that that was a really good idea. So I'm not sure that he did exactly what David Edgar suggested, but they provided us with what is called an enhanced free freeze kit from uh, the Vitra Life uh, Research and Development Department that we have been using since October last year. So that's when you saw that shift in our uh, results. Uh, we washed them briefly in the first buffer that has HSA. We moved them into a freezing solution. And at that time, when we moved the embryos into the freezing solution, we set a timer on 10 minutes. We then immediately start loading straws. We go to our freezing machine, timer stick till ticking, straws in the machine. And on the dot 10 minutes, we press the start on the freezing machine. It takes us just a few seconds to finish the whole freezing procedure. It's very, very quick. And then we just use a normal cooling program with 0 0.3 degrees and rah, rah, rah. We thaw in air and then follow by the water bath, just the normal slow freezing. But we shorten down the time, as in this Edgar publication, um, by five minutes per solution. So it is a very, very quick way of thawing embryos. If we look at the results, and these are embryos that have both been frozen and thawed in the new enhanced thaw kit, freeze kit. Uh, out of the zygotes, we've thawed and frozen 20 so far with 100% survival rate. If we look at day two embryos, uh, we have thawed 94 with 81 survived, so an 86% survival rate. Uh, Edgar et al. has a slightly higher survival rate here, but they probably freeze better, better quality embryos than we do. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is always the ongoing pregnancy rates from this. And with the new kit, we have a 47% uh, clinical pregnancy rate from 34 cycles. So it, we feel extremely confident in this. Looking at embryos that has been thawed but are frozen with other methods but are thawed in the new enhanced kit... Uh, we thought uh, about 400 from January to October 2010 with a survival rate of 72%. From October when we introduced a new one, we thought 430 with an 80%. So we can see that just using the thaw kit, we have an improvement in the survival rate. And looking at the clinical pregnancy rate, uh, those embryos uh, thawed with the old style vitro life kits uh, had a lower uh, pregnancy rate. Uh, this is not significant, these differences, but, but I do think that we can be quite comfortable in saying that it's a very good kit. So what can we do about this elevated progesterone and antagonist cycle? Because it probably is that antagonist cycle is not bad for the embryos, but they're probably bad for the endometrium. So what can we do? Well, we started to do freezals. And on any given week at the moment, we have between 10 and 30% of our patients having a complete freeze -all. <clears throat> Because we have such good success with the slow freezing at 2 p.m. stage, we freeze 2 p.m. in groups of four. And we then move on and thaw them and culture them to blastocyst. So if a patient has more than four, then obviously we freeze them in smaller groups, but we aim to do a thaw where we have four surviving embryos that are cultured to blastocyst. We offer all our patients thaw plans. They can either have one thawed and SET the same day, 
two thawed and double embryo transfer the same day, very simple. That's what we call a conservative plan. We can do overnight culture where we thaw one more than what we are going to need, culture overnight, and pick the best. Or we offer a liberal thaw plant for blastocyst single embryo transfer where we thaw four embryos or zygotes and culture to blastocyst for a single blastocyst culture. And looking at this approach, we can see that when we thaw four zygotes and go to blastocyst, we have a 50% clinical pregnancy rate. So I have absolutely nothing to lose by freezing the embryos from the patients where I'm not so sure that their endometrium is, is proper um, and still have a very, very good pregnancy rate from that. Uh, now, looking at when we thaw more embryos than the four that we have set, it actually doesn't improve the chances. So it seems like four is a golden number for thawing in a group and culturing on to blastocysts. So the lessons that I want to communicate to you that I feel that I've learned from my clinical setting the last year is that dish preparations is important. We need to leave things alone. We need to be less curious and let nature have its course and look at embryos only when we desperately need to look at them or when we are changing cultural medium. We need to understand the implication of clinical decisions and try to influence them. So it is only through screaming and aggression that you can make your, your clinicians change their ways. Uh, slow freezing works. Ha ha. And I think that new approaches to freeze or can overcome some of the clinical variables that we see. So understanding our results comes from hard work and controlling our variables and understanding our embryos need and our own clinical setting can aid us in achieving consistent pregnancy rate. Thank you, everyone. Yes, my team, my great embryologists. And uh, when you live in Sydney, you can do a bridge climb. You're welcome to visit us. Uh, thank you very much.